This is going to be a relatively long video. We're going to look at every single thing that we need to know from session one, uh, section one, sorry. So the idea of this is that you might watch it uh, before you start revising uh, to get an idea of where the gaps in your knowledge are, or you might watch it at the end of your revision to see what you've missed. Let's have a look at what's going to be in the video first. We will have uh, what you need to know. So basically it's just going to cover everything that you need to know and how much you need to know about it and we'll go through some sample questions as well but what we won't have is in-depth details on each topic okay so this isn't meant to be a standalone revision video which you can use without any other revision and get an a star the idea is that it tells you the topics that you need to know and it does that in enough detail that you can get enough understanding of them to do your own research to develop that so, for example, we'll look at data representation and how data is stored, uh, but we're not going to look specifically about how magnets are used, for example, in hard disk drives. Uh, that's something that you'll have to do on your own. For section 1, or 1.1, you need to know how to convert binary decimal and hexadecimal, okay, one into the other and into each other. So, for example, binary into decimal, binary into hexadecimal, decimal into binary, decimal into hexadecimal, hexadecimal into binary, and hexadecimal into decimal. So it's not good enough that you just know how to convert binary one way. You need to know all of them interchangeably. We also need to know at least a couple of uses for each one of them. It might ask you, give us two uses of hexadecimal. It's an easy two marks if you know it. It's a very difficult two marks if you haven't got a clue. Um, you need to understand some different file formats. Uh, you need to understand how music, video, pictures and text are stored within data. And finally, you need to understand about lossy and lossless compression. So let's just have a very quick look at the sort of conversions you might be asked to do. Let's say, for example, you were asked to convert this number from binary into decimal. Remember, decimal in the exam is also called denary or deanery. Okay, so if you see D-E-N-A-R-Y, that's talking about decimal. Okay, you can use those terms interchangeably. So... We've got one, two, three, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven digits here. The reason I gave seven digits for this example is because it doesn't make a full byte. You need to remember when you're figuring this out that you leave the gap on the left hand side. Everything goes on the right. Now you can probably ask uh, your invigilator during the exam for extra paper to be able to work this out. Possibly they might give you this in the exam and you fill it in. Uh, but if you need extra paper you can ask for that and you can write out this table yourself. Remember the digits double every time. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. And as I said, everything goes on the right hand side. If you've got three bits, they go 4, 2, 1. You don't put them up here. Otherwise you'll end up with a very big number instead of a very small one. So then all we do, all I've done with this one is I've put it into here and we add together the ones that have a 1. So we've got 64 plus 8 plus 2, which is 73. Okay, so that will be the answer for that one. Simple. What about the other ones? Though? What about hexadecimal? If you're going from binary to hexadecimal, remember every individual digit, we're going to split it up and we're going to work out the binary for each one of those with four digits. Obviously, to be able to do this, you need to understand hexadecimal. You need to understand that it's uh, 0 to F which represents 0 to 15. You need to know that A is 10, you need to know that B is 11, etc. You need to know the basics of hexadecimal to be able to answer any of these questions. When it gives you a conversion, you're just splitting up those digits. A looks like this, 1, 0, 1, 0. 5 is 0, 1, 0, 1, because if I go back here, look, 5 is 1, 2, 4, so 0, 1, 0, 1. And D is 1, 1, 0, 1. All you need to remember for this one is to put four digits for each of the numbers or the digits that are um, not on the left hand side okay so if you've got a 5d the 5 needs to have four digits even if some of them are zeros if you don't give it four digits the conversion doesn't work also remember that you don't need four digits on the left it's the equivalent of saying that you're 12 years old or you're zero one two years old Okay, or you're 120 years old. Where the zero goes matters. You can't get rid of a zero on the right or in the middle of a number, but you can get rid of zeros on the left. So if that wasn't an A, 
If that was a 3, we could just say 1-1. One, one. We wouldn't have to say 0-0-1-1. Zero, zero, one, one. Although you won't be marked down for having, had, um, having leading zeros unless it mentions it. Okay? When you are going from decimal to hexadecimal, what I recommend is, because the maths can get quite tricky and you're not allowed a calculator, what I recommend is you figure out the hexadecimal. Let's say that it said, let's say that it, the, um, the question was 73 decimal to hexadecimal. I would lay it out like this. Okay, I will put it into binary first and then I would split it into groups of four. Okay, so the answer to that will be one, two, four. So a four on the left hand side and um, that would be the same so that would be 10 which will be a so we'll be looking at 4a what I'm saying is make what I recommend you do is if you're going from decimal to hexadecimal use binary in between to make it easier for you mathematically okay as I said we're not going to go through the specifics <coughs> of how to do these and lots of examples because this is just telling you what you need to know for the exam so you now need to know uses of these, okay? We've not been asked uses of decimal before um, in an exam, but they do want you to know uses of binary and uses of hexadecimal. Binary is used to represent transistor states in computers, ons or offs. So we use binary to represent whether a transistor is on or a transistor is off. We also use it to represent numbers in digital displays like clocks, okay? So a clock uh, digital display could have four bytes which represent each of those numbers. We also use it in CPU registers. Uses of hexadecimal, we use it to represent colors, okay? And we use it to represent MAC addresses. That's your uses of hexadecimal, okay? Now, in terms of the file formats that you need to know, these are the four that are listed in the uh, specification, in the curriculum. You need to know MIDI and what it is. Sometimes it will ask you, what is MIDI? And it might give you two marks. One mark will be um, come from actually splitting up the acronym into its individual components, musical instrument, digital interface, and the other mark might be from saying something about it. MIDI is digital sound, where each instrument is given a specific track. You can have four track, you can have eight tracks, okay? But that's what MIDI is. JPEG, which is a lossy image compression format, MP3 is a lossy sound compression format, and MP4 is a lossy video compression format. Okay? So it's video form. I mean, it's not necessarily, it's not specifically a compression format. It's compressed. Maybe I should have said a compressed video format there. Okay? So if they were to give you two marks and say, what is MP3? You could say it's lossy. It uses lossy compression. And it's a sound file. Okay? Two marks. Same for MP4, but with video. Okay? Next, we've got... Error checking, okay? Firstly, we've got parity checking. So in error checking, there are quite a few different um, error checking methods that you need to know about. You need to know about ARQ, um, you need to know about echo checking, you need to know about parity checking, and you need to know about check digits or check sums. Parity checking is that one where we have either an even or odd number of ones, okay? Let's say, for example, we wanted to transfer this byte to another computer, okay, we would agree with the other computer whether we we're going to use odd or even parity. If it's odd parity, you are looking for an odd number of ones, okay? Let's say the question asks you, what would the parity bit be for this if it was odd parity, okay? The parity bit for this would be a one, okay? If it already has the parity bit inside it, and it's asking you, would this pass the parity check? They will make it clear to you which one the parity bit is. They might put it in brackets like I have. They might make it red. So parity checking, that's something you need to know as well. And you need to be able to answer the questions of, um, would this pass even parity or odd parity? And suggest what the parity bit should be. Okay. So let's say they gave you this. And they said, with odd parity, what should the parity bit be? Well, we count the number of ones. We've got one, two, three, four, five, and that's an odd number. So we already have an odd number. So we don't need to add a one parity. We can use a zero parity bit. They might also give you what's called a parity block. And in that one, you're checking horizontal and vertical. 
checking each byte in turn and trying to find the cross section of where the error is. There's an example of that in the book. Next, we've got a checksum. The checksum is that one that you see on barcodes. Okay. It's a calculation. Every time we scan this barcode with a barcode scanner, we do this calculation, it's a specific calculation, we perform an algorithm, and the answer to that algorithm should be the check digit, which is on the right. So the check sum is the calculation done, and the check digit is the outcome of that calculation. You will always be given the algorithm. You don't have to remember Loon's algorithm or the ISBN uh, check digit, check sum. It will give you that. You're not expected to remember that. Okay, so a checksum is a calculation, the checksum is the calculation, and the check digit is the number. So for example, when you scan this at the supermarket, the calculation might be, we double this one, and we double this one, and we double this one, and we double this one, double this one, and we add them all together and divide by, I don't know, 10, and the answer for the digit on the left should be a 1. If it isn't, it's failed, okay? I'm just giving you an example of an algorithm there. As I said, you don't need to know the algorithm. If you find one of these questions in the exam, just read it very, very carefully. Then we've got something called ARQ. Still looking at error checking. This is called an automatic repeat request. The automatic repeat request is when we transfer data from one place to another and we wait, the sending computer waits for the receiving computer to send what's called an acknowledgement. Basically say, yep, I got it. If the receiving computer doesn't say, yes, I got it, then the sending computer sends it over again. Okay, it waits for something called a timeout. That timeout might be, let me just say a random example, 30 seconds. It sends the data. If it hasn't received it in 30 seconds, it sends it again. Obviously it wouldn't be 30 seconds because that's far too long. I'm just giving you an example there. Finally, we've got the echo check. With this one, we send data and we ask for it back. And then we compare the two. And if they're the same, then that transmission was successful. Think about, for example, if you send an email to a friend. You ask that friend, send me the email back. When they send it back to you, you check it. If it's the same, then it means there was no transmission error. If it's not the same, it means there was a transmission error and you can send it again. You don't necessarily know whether the transmission error is when it went out or when it came back, but either way, we resend the data. Okay, final part of this data representation is lossy versus lossless. I've got a video on that in the uh, channel. So lossy data compression is where we make something smaller by taking things out that we can't put back. Lossless is where we take something out, but we can return it, or we change something, but we can get back our original meaning. Okay? Lossy methods. If you're compressing an image, you might remove pixels, you might remove colors. In a video, you might remove the frames. So instead of 60 FPS video, we might have 30 FPS video. We've halved the size of it. You might lower the resolution, again, removing the pixels. For audio, we might remove the number of samples per second, and we might also lower the number of bits in each one of those samples. Remember, a sample is um, a digitization of, of an analog signal that happens every so often. You can do a thousand samples a second, okay? If you do 500 samples a second, that's half the size. If you keep with a thousand samples per second, but instead of each one of those samples being eight bits, we make them four bits. Again, we've half the size of it. Lossless is a bit more tricky. Let's just look at two methods quickly. Uh, we'll start on the right here. This is a lossless method of compression. It's called run length encoding, RLE. Where we have repeating values, Instead of having that repeating value, we just put the number of the values after the value. So there are three A's there, so we wrote A3. There is one B there, B1. There are four C's there, so C4. Okay? This is lossless. We can get back that original data. Obviously, to be able, for this to be useful, you have to have a lot of repeating values. Otherwise, you can actually make the thing bigger, because if you see this B, B actually became two instead of one. Here we have something called the Huffman tree, which is where we build 
a um, representation of a tree and an algorithm. The most common of our data, pieces of data, this example is letters, go at the top. The least common go at the bottom. And now E has become zero. U has become one, zero, zero. D has become one, zero, one, okay? So it's unlikely that you're going to be asked anything complex about this, but you can be aware of it and possibly put in an answer of describing, for example, a, a lossless compression method. Um, this is more A-level though, but having a, a bit of background knowledge in it can help. Next, communication and internet technologies. So what we need to know for this is these things here. Throughout this video, you might want to pause on these pages here. You might want to pause anywhere and take some notes. Okay, um, We might go over some things really quickly. So feel free to pause the video and just have a look at these and make sure you understand all these. So we need to know what serial transmission is, what parallel is, understand the uses of both of those. We need to know the difference between simplex, half duplex and full duplex. We need to understand security aspects and how to minimize the risk. Understand malware. Explain how antivirus minimizes risk and explain how information gets from the internet to your computer. That's a little bit of a sort of vague generalization um, because it's kind of a vague topic. We'll talk about that. So firstly, serial versus parallel. Simple. Serial communication is where we have one bus line and every bit goes on the same line. Parallel, we have lots of bus lines. Every bit gets its own bus line in the transmission. Parallel is faster at slower cycle speeds. It's a very difficult question to answer which one is faster. Theoretically, I mean, if we're talking simply about speed and not about accuracy, parallel is faster because instead of transferring them one by one, we're doing them all at the same time. However, as we increase the number of cycles per second, parallel gets very, very uh, tricky to keep a handle on making sure these bits are arriving there. There are two things that can happen cross talk and skewing cross talk is where one of these bits jumps to the other line next to it okay because these are lines are made of metal and metal is conductive the bits can jump across also we can have something called skewing where um, some bits arrive before another bit and we it assumes that that bit that didn't arrive in time was a zero parallel is more expensive this is cheaper Okay, we only use parallel over short distances. So for example, integrated circuits. In serial, we use it pretty much everywhere. USB, universal serial bus, okay? So there we go, uses of serial and parallel. We've got USB, printers, mouse, keyboard, etc. cetera. Um, integrated circuits for parallel. Now within that, and these aren't three separate things, these are overlapping. We've got simplex, full duplex, and half duplex. It's worth remembering, Full duplex is also just called duplex. It's not always called full duplex. Okay, so you might see simplex, full duplex, uh, sorry, simplex, half duplex, and duplex. Or you might see um, simplex, half duplex, and full duplex. Okay, I've just realized these are the wrong way around. Bear with me a second. Correct that mistake. So, Simplex is where the sender sends information and the receiver receives it, but it doesn't come back. We can only send data in one direction. If you ask for an example, baby monitor. Okay, the information goes from the baby to the parent. They listen to the sound, they listen, they watch the video, but they can't send information across the other way on the baby monitor. Well, usually at least. So, half duplex down here. They're in a weird order. Half duplex is where we can send and receive data, but not at the same time. A two-way radio, those things the police have, where you have to hold it, and then you, press, uh, you say over, so the other guy can talk. We can't talk at the same time. That's two-way radio. USB 2.0 and the earlier versions of USB uh, uh, 3, they use um, half duplex. Okay, So you can't send and receive data at the same time. If you've ever copied something from a USB stick in USB 2 and um, to put something on the USB stick at the same time, you'll notice you, your two sort of progress bars 
one will stop and the other one will start, then that will stop and the other one will stop. USB 3 uh, and telephone are examples of full duplex. Both people can talk at the same time on a telephone. And later, uh, full speed versions, full speed mode version of USB 3 is full duplex. Okay, security aspects. Um, basically, you need to understand, it says, malware, the umbrella term, and what it is composed of. Okay, so malware, remember, includes viruses, it includes spyware, it includes adware. Okay, those three things. Anything that is malicious. Malware is malicious software. It's the portmanteau of malicious software. Okay, virus... Um, spyware, adware. Then we need to have a little bit of knowledge about how antivirus software works. Okay? So we need to know, uh, before we go on to that, sorry, we need to know what adware, spyware, and viruses are. Okay? So, remember, malware is the umbrella term. A virus in a computer is just something that infects your computer. Okay? That is not intended to be on there. That does something negative to your computer. So it may destroy files, okay? It may copy itself and send information from one place to another. It may lock your files, okay? It may change your files. Adware is software that advertises to you. And spyware is software that watches what the user is doing. So, how does antivirus software work? Um, we have a database of known viruses, okay, and we compare each file to that database. If the antivirus software finds a file that is the same as the file that we've got in our database, we know it's a virus. We also use something called heuristics, which is signature-based detection. If a file is doing something which it shouldn't be, which we know that some viruses do, so for example, if you've got a Word document that is sending excess amounts of information to the internet, that could be an example of heuristics where we're looking at what it's doing. How can we prevent hacking? Okay, this is in security aspects as well. Strong passwords. Education. So if you're in a company training people on how to um, avoid giving their information away. And the use of firewalls. Okay, we'll look more about firewalls now. So as I said, we're going through these very, very quickly. Uh, we're not talking about the specific detail here. We're just talking about what you need to know on a base level so you can go away and you can look at strong passwords you can look at firewalls what they do you can do some more research on heuristics you can look a little bit more about malware this is telling you about what you need to know next we have a little bit of a tricky one we've got internet principles of operation so what this includes is basically how data is transmitted over the internet and in there we need to understand all of these keywords ip <coughs> mac DNS, firewall, server, browser, client, and packet. You need to know what each of those is and be able to put them into an order, into sort of a narrative. Okay. So here we've got our computer, PC. We've got a firewall. We've got a router or a modem. Um, well, the router contains a modem. Um, and we've got a DNS server and we've got our final uh, destination server. Okay. You need to know what each of these does, what the role of it is. So you would talk about, for example, how we enter a search term into our browser, okay? That goes through our firewall and makes sure that that data is allowed to um, exit. Then it goes to the router. It gets separated into packets. The router finds out the DNS. Um, so it uses the DNS server to find out the name of the destination. For example, if you type google.com, google.com doesn't exist. Um, it's just a domain name. We need the IP address. Okay, that's what the DNS does. The DNS connects the IP address with the domain name. So it gives us back the IP address. And then we can send that information in packets to the server. The server will send it back to us. It will go through the firewall to check for anything that's uh, nefarious and shouldn't be in there. And it will come back to our computer. You need to know each of these in a decent amount of detail. Okay? 
So, <coughs> uh, to a, distinct, a distinction you need to understand, you need to make sure you understand the difference between IP address and MAC address. The IP address is the location of your network, okay? So, you, your house um, will have an IP address if it's got one internet connection coming into it. However, each individual device has its own MAC address, okay? So, the MAC address doesn't change. It's the address of the specific device. The IP address can change if you've got dynamic IP. Um, and it's the location of your network. It doesn't say anything about specific uh, devices. Well, not at the point where the internet, the network enters your house. After it enters your house, it can be split up into individual subnets and things, but that's a little bit more A-level. We also need to understand the absolute basics of HTML. Now, you don't need to be able to create a web page. But what you do need to know is you need to know the difference between structure and presentation, okay? Presentation being how the web page looks, structure being um, where things are, okay? Then you need to understand some basic tags. What I recommend for this is to go to W3Schools, type into Google W3Schools HTML, and maybe follow the very short tutorial on how to make a, an HTML page that looks like this. These are the tags here. You just need to understand basically what they look like. You could have this in an exam, and it could say, um, it could ask you about this line here. It could say, what is the H1 tag? And you'd have to say that that is a heading tag. There aren't many questions about this historically in the exams, um, but obviously we need to know it just in case. Next up, we've got logic gates. This is probably one of, if not the most important part of section one. The reason being that it's always multiple marks and it's usually between sort of uh, eight to ten marks for the total um, number of questions that are in there about logic gates. There are several things you can be asked and it's really, really easy to get these marks. If you understand logic gates, it's quite difficult for you to make a mistake as long as you're careful enough and you spend enough time following things through, okay? So, um, these are the gates that you need to know. You need to know what the NOT gate does, so that obviously flips things over. You put a 1 in, 0 comes out. We need to know an AND gate, which takes only 1 and 1. We need to know the OR gate, which takes any combination of 1s. We need to t um, know the, the NAND gate, which is the opposite of the AND gate. It's the equivalent of an AND gate with a NOT gate after it. We need to know the NOR gate, which is the opposite of the OR gate, and the XOR gate, which is exclusive OR, which is kind of like an OR gate, apart from it doesn't take 1 and 1, it only takes 1 and 0 either way, okay? There are three things that you'll be asked. You'll have to create a statement, okay, or read a statement, convert a scenario into a logic circuit, and to create and understand truth tables, okay? This is what statements look like. They might also have the symbols, okay? If it has a line on top of A, that means not, instead of having the not. The plus sign means or, confusingly, but that's just because of how uh, binary addition works. Uh, the dot means and, and plus in a circle means XOR, okay? So you will almost certainly see it like this, but if you've learned to write it in symbols, then you can use the symbols. So for example, this says um, X equals not A NAND B or B nor C. Pay attention where the brackets are, okay? Do it exactly like you would in a mathematics uh, exam go to your inner brackets and connect to those ones first. So with this example, you would connect A and B with a NAND. Separately, you would connect B and C with a NOR. And then you would connect both of those with an OR. Okay? And then at the end of that, before you connect it to um, your X, you would put a NOT gate. Okay? Anyway, you need to know how to create these from statements and from scenarios. The scenario looks like this, okay? You'll be given, for example, it will say, a warning system um, will produce an output of one that will sound the alarm W when either of these conditions apply, okay? And then you've got to read this and convert this into a statement or into a uh, logic circuit. In this specific example, W is the output, 
Be careful when you're reading the letters to understand which one is the output. The output will be quite clear because it will be the first letter written. This one here doesn't actually have the letters written with it. Okay, but when this question was in the exam, there was a big box that you draw the logic circuit in, and it was clear that um, H was for height and S was for speed. Um, and there was something about descending as well. Anyway, height is less than 500 and the airplane is descending. These are really easy to make. All you are looking for are the keywords. You're looking for any words which correspond to a gate. Okay, so if you're struggling, look at the first sentence and see which connective it has inside it. This one's got an and. Okay, so we just connect that thing with an and gate. This one connects to this one with an AND gate, and these two connect with an OR gate. However, you also need to make sure that, and it will give you a table separately to, to understand which of these represent one and which of these represent zero. For example, the aeroplane descending might be a zero, so you would need to put a NOT gate before that. Anyway, there is a, um, a video in the channel about logic gates, and you can look into that, get some more information on this. It's not possible in this video to go into complete depth about this. It's quite a, a large topic. Okay, moving on. Next part is input devices. Okay. With input devices, um, you've got quite a few input devices to look at. Okay. The input devices that we need to have, we need to understand are 2D and 3D scanners. Okay. Barcode readers. QR code readers, digital cameras, keyboards, mice, touch screens, interactive whiteboards, and microphones. What I would suggest to you for input and output devices is for each device, find four principles of operation. What I mean by that is four um, sort of technical parts of its working. Three or four. So, for example, barcode reader. You could say um, the barcode shines a red light. Yeah, the black bars absorb the light. The white parts reflect the light. It's converted into uh, digital data. It beeps when it passes the checksum. Okay, these individual things are what I mean by principles of operation. Okay, so you need to think of I would say three or four principles of operation for each one and at least two uses for each one. It might sound really obvious, okay, but just make sure you've got those. Make sure you're, you've got two uses for a keyboard so that you're not sat there in the exam wasting time trying to think of something really obvious like this. Okay, so these are the input devices that you need to know. All right. Um, within input devices, there is also sensors, okay? Sensors you need to know these following sensors, all right? You don't need to understand the technical details of how they work, as in you don't need to understand how they convert data or, or how they're reading an analog signal. You need to give uses of each one of these. So uh, light, temperature, magnetic field, gas, pressure, moisture, humidity, and motion. Think of a couple of uses for each one of these. Don't leave any out because um, it will probably come up in the exam. So. When, um, apart from the questions on the uses of each sensor, it might also ask you to explain how a sensor is used in a scenario. This is a really common question, and it's always four or five marks, and it's always exactly the same. Okay? For example, it will say something like, um, let me just find this on my slides. Sorry, hold on one second. Where is it? There we go. So like for example, this one says, um, Jamelia has a greenhouse that she uses to grow fruit and vegetables. She needs to make sure that the temperature in the greenhouse stays between 25C and 30C. Okay? A system that has a temperature sensor and a microprocessor, um, a... Uh, is used to maintain the temperature in the greenhouse. The system will open a window and turn the heater off if it gets too cold, close a window and turn the heater off on if it gets too cold. Uh, sorry, too hot or too cold. Describe how the system 
uses the temperature sensor and the microprocessor to maintain the temperature of the greenhouse. It sounds really, really complex, but all of these are exactly the same. Let me explain by showing one more of these. <coughs> this one is slightly different. It says the conditions in a fish tank are being controlled using sensors and a microprocessor. To keep the fish healthy, the temperature must be at 25 degrees C and the oxygen content needs to be 20 parts per million. The tank contains a heater and an oxygen inlet controlled by a valve. Describe how sensors are used to maintain the correct conditions. So these two questions, they look quite different, okay? But actually they're asking pretty much the same thing. What we're, how we're going to answer this is, let's just think of this one as an, uh, for our example. They all have a similar setup and they're all answered in exactly the same way, okay? Firstly, you say, whatever the sensor was it was asking you for, sends the value to the microprocessor. So in this example here, that was a oxygen sensor and a temperature sensor, okay? In this example up here, this one was a temperature sensor only, okay? Simple. Now we need to, in the next part, say um, that the values are converted using an analog to digital converter. Okay, that's the same for every sensor. The values are compared to stored variables. Okay, and now you're going to be kind of specific to whatever scenario it's talking about. In our example of the fish tank, if the oxygen is too low, the oxygen is released. Okay, so you say what happens if the um, sensor's reading is different to the stored value. If the temperature is too low, the heater is activated, the process repeats permanently. Looking back at this one here, this one says we open a window and turn off the heater if it's too hot, close a window, turn off the heater if it's too cold. Okay, so you would convert this and you would say, we open a window and turn the heater off if the reading is higher than the stored value, and we do the opposite if it's lower than the stored value. Then at the end, for the extra final mark, you just say the process repeats. Remember this, because this is how you answer every single one of the sensor scenario questions, which come up really frequently, okay? You just use the same, and you replace the keywords with the, the, what's specific to yours, all right? Um, okay, so there are input devices, in, and sensors are extra to that. Within touch screens, there are th four different types of screens it wants you to know about, okay? They're resistive, capacitive, infrared, optical, and infrared heat. This is um, a little table which explains the differences between these things. Um, as well as the differences between them, make sure that you know how they compare to each other um, in terms of positives and negatives. So capacitive is better for this um, reason when compared to resistive. It's not as good as infrared optical in this way. So compare and contrast them and then find some positives and negatives and some uses. OK, you can just pause the video here or you can screenshot that or whatever and have a look at that. It's also in the book. OK, output devices. Output devices, we've got inkjet, laser and 3D printers, 2D and 3D cutters, speakers, headphones and actuators, flat panel um, display screens. So we've got LCD, LED, OK, <coughs> and LCD and digital light processors, um, projectors. So for each one of these, again, learn four principles of operation and compare between them with other types. If they've got more than one in a category, like I just said for um, touch screens, compare and contrast them, okay? So you can't compare and contrast a speaker, okay? Um, but you could with the different display types and with uh, inkjet, laser jet, and 3D, okay? Also make sure that you know a use of each one. So in this scenario, LCD is better. In this scenario, LED is better. Moving on, we've got two, uh, quite a comp complicated bit here. Okay, computer architecture and the fetch execute cycle. For this part, you need to know, you need to understand the von Neumann model and the stored program concept. You need to understand the registers and buses used in the fetch execute cycle and you need to understand the stages of it, okay? So, the von Neumann model, okay? Programs and, so von Neumann, John von Neumann, I think it's pronounced actually, John von Neumann came up with this idea of the stored program concept. He stated that instead of rewiring a computer to do a different function, 
what we should do is we should store what it does, the program, in memory. We sh shouldn't just store the data and the outcomes of um, calculations in memory. We should also store the program in memory. Because what they used to have to do is rewire these huge machines if you wanted to change what calculations it does. The stored program concept says we don't need to do that. We can store the actual program itself in memory. Okay? Um, so this is the stored program concept. It's kind of an umbrella term. There are other stored program concepts, such as the Harvard model, where programs and data are stored separately. Um, and so von Neumann model isn't the only stored program concept, but it's one of them, and it's the one you need to know about. So the fetch execute cycle is basically the cycle that takes place every time your computer performs a calculation or performs an operation, not necessarily calculation. We measure it in hertz, okay? So the number of hertz is the number of cycles that uh, your CPU goes through. The fetch execute cycle consists of a memory unit, which is here, and some registers. What this is about is how data moves around the CPU and how things get calculated. The PC is the program counter. Okay, this um, keeps track of which number we're on. <coughs> so if you've got, let's say, for example, if the cycle that you're, or the um, instructions that you're going through were on instruction number three, in the program counter will be number three. Memory address register holds the location of the data that we're looking at. Each of these little boxes in the memory unit has an address. This is, the address is where this is held. The memory data register, the memory buffer register, this one is the holding room for the data that's inside here until it can go to the current instruction register. Okay, the current instruction register holds the data we're looking at right now. The ALU is the arithmetic logic unit, it does the calculations, and the accumulator is where we hold accumulating values. So if we were doubling numbers, then this is where we would hold the accumulated values, like two, four, six, eight, okay? So this is what you might have to write in the exam if it asks you about the fetch execute cycle. Okay, this is the order that it comes in. If it's six marks, you have to put six things. If it's five marks, you have to put five things. Remember as well, there are buses. Okay, there is the address bus, which carries the addresses, and the locations. There is the data bus, which carries the actual uh, data. Okay, and then there's the control bus, which basically makes sure that everything is working at the same time. It carries information um, to synchronize the process. Within this section, the fetch execute uh, cycle and um, computer architecture, we have operating system. For operating systems, there's not much you need to know. You need to know the functions of an operating system. It might ask you for four or five functions. There's a huge graph in the uh, diagram in the book which shows you all of the functions of an operating system. Okay, so remember a few of those. Also, you need to understand the four different types of operating system. Single user, single task, single user, multitask, multi-user, and real time. Okay, so you need to know the definition of each of these things. Okay, nearly at the end here. Memory, storage devices, and media. Some of these have been in a bit of a strange order. Okay, It's not necessarily the order they are in the book. I've mixed some of these things up. So, you need to know about each of these things. You need to know how much data it holds, how fast they are compared to other types, and some basic data about information about how they store data. You don't need to know the specifics, the technical specifics of how they store data. But for Blu-ray, for example, CD and DVD, you need to know that they use pits and bumps. Okay, you need to know that a laser cuts in to the disk. Yeah? For ROM and RAM and SSD, well, for, for SSD specifically, you need to know what solid state storage is. It stores using floating electrons. With a hard disk drive, <coughs> you can you need to know um, that it is stored using uh, magnets. 
which are polarized to represent zeros or ones. Also, you need to know the difference between primary, secondary, and offline storage. Primary storage is the storage inside your computer that has access to the CPU. Secondary storage is inside your computer, but it is not directly connected to the CPU. So primary is these two. Secondary is these two. And anything which is stored outside of the computer, you can remove it and store it somewhere else, but it keeps its data, is offline. Two more, three more things. I think. So we've got high and low level languages. High and low level languages, right, you need to know what the benefits of each of these are. You need to be able to identify them. It might show you a high level and a low level language and ask you which one is which. Okay, and the, uh, as I said, the positives and negatives. So this one <coughs> is easier to read because it's like a structured English. This one is more difficult to read because it's very short commands. Within there, we've got interpreters and compilers. Interpreter, how does it convert code into machine language? How does a compiler do that and what are the differences? On top of that is an assembler. The assembler is used only for converting assembly language into machine code. Okay, it uses what's called passes, a number of passes to convert it. Every pass, it will do a different thing, and it creates a symbol table. Okay, a symbol table are the um, part. It separates up the parts of code and puts it in a table. Moving on to public and private key encryption. Firstly, we've got uh, this fits in with SSL, okay, and security. So we're going to have a look at security now. Public private key encryption uses one key. Okay. Public key encryption uses two keys. Public key encryption is used in SSL. Okay. SSL is that when you go online and it's got a little padlock next to your um, web address that you've typed in. These are the stages of establishing an SSL connection. Okay. Go through them. Make sure you understand them. It's very rare that this comes up, but if it does, it might be five marks, okay? So understand how the browser communicates with the server and how they pass over the um, certificate and how we get the uh, key from the certificate, etc. The hacking methods that you need to know about that are in the book are DOS and DDoS, phishing and farming. That is all really, really simple stuff, okay? Then, right at the end here, we've got ethics. There are five things you need to know about ethics. Firstly, we've got three different types of software. Freeware, free software and shareware. <coughs> Remember, freeware is the one that's free, but you can't change the source code. Free software, you can change the source code and redistribute it. Shareware has some form of limitation. Make sure you can explain like two or three limitations that might exist in shareware. For example, it might have a time limit. It might have limited features. It might have a watermark on it if it's uh, video editing. And then the difference between plagiarism and copyright. So plagiarism, pretending you've written something that you haven't, passing off someone's work as your own. And copyright, using someone else's work in something you have produced without asking for permission. You're not necessarily saying you did it, but you've used it without asking them. Okay. Now, I understand that this was a really, really quick sort of um, tour of what we need to know. But... The idea is that you pause this and you use this just to fill the gaps. But I guess the best time to use this is either right at the beginning of your revision or right at the end. Because you might realize right at the end, I didn't look at copyright, I didn't look at plagiarism. Okay? So, good luck with your exam. And anything you need, you can ask.